Okay, let me just put some notes down here. I've got a few things to say. This is a two-part presentation. Um, I intend to go over the first part this morning fairly quickly. It'll be much of the same this afternoon. I hope some of you will join me, but it will be in a lot more detail. Uh, what do I do? I teach golf. The golf channel is just a little side thing for me, a little hobby. It's a hobby that takes a lot of time. But I teach golf most days. I teach in the trenches and have them for 35 years. Um, it is an enormous honor and a pleasure to be here today. And I hope that after 35 years of being in the trenches, I've got something sensible to say. Shame if I haven't. Uh, every presentation I do, I start by reading something from the American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson. It means a lot to me every speech I give, and it's, it's my sort of thought for every speech that I give. Here's what he said many years ago. The purpose of all public speaking is to move the listeners to take action of some kind. Action that they would not have taken in the absence of the talk. Every time I speak to a group, every time I give a lesson, as a matter of fact, that's what I'm trying to do. Get people to take action that perhaps they would not have taken. And so my topic today is hand action as I see it. Let's see if I can use this properly. Hand action as I see it. Yes, I can. Now, I've spent a lot of time with Greg and Dave. We know, and I'm talking about the lead risk when I'm talking hand action today. And the hand action is, there's three functions. There's on the radial. Uh, you'll see why I'm using this short club in a moment, but there's on the radial, which basically we could call cocking and uncocking of the lead wrist. We've got flexion and extension, which could be flexion, could be bowing, extension could be cupping. And then there's pronation and supination, which is sort of turning and rolling. And those of you that have looked into 3D technology in the lead wrist, you know it's a combination of all three. Now, let me just say this. After years in the trenches, what I used to teach first, I now teach last. What I used to teach first, I now teach last. I can remember a lesson I gave many years ago to a lovely lady called Maxine Eva down at St. Andrews in Boca Raton. I still think of it as Black Sunday. I tried so hard to get to hit the ball, and I was determined, lag, she was going to have some lag coming down if it killed me. And it very nearly killed her. <laughs> but what I used to teach first, I now teach last, and you will see. Of course we can look at Sergio, and people who have tremendous lag, and, and it seems like a badge of courage, something that we must, oh, the more lag, the better. I'm not convinced that's the lag we should be looking at, and in fact, I think there are three types of lag, all from the hand action. So let me get going on this, um, and I think the fact that what I used to teach first, I now teach last, my students hit the ball better because of it. My influences who put me here, the great Henry Cotton, three-time Open champion, John Jacobs, probably the father of modern golf instruction. Bob Toskey, 88 years of age, I was with him last week, as dynamic as ever. Peter Costis, someone who influenced me early on. The sort of the, the, the theme that ran through all four of those people with the teaching, the hands. Never forget the hands. So let me get going with what I've got to say today. Um, the whip analogy. Golf is like cracking a whip, it's like a towel snap. You crack the handle and the end of the whip cracks. True, with a whip. Slightly different with a golf swing. Um, you know, with a whip, the end, the tip, has to comply with what you did with the handle. I'm afraid these things, they're a bit of a nuisance in a way. They have to be educated. They don't necessarily what you do with, do, they don't necessarily do what you did with your glutes and your abs. I, there's no problem with the kinematic sequence, it's great for power, but I think you can have a kinematic sequence that's wonderful and still be a poor player. And I think there's a difference between efficient and effective. Nice to have them both, but if I have to choose one over the other, I choose effective. I choose getting the club on the ball properly, and I think the hands have to be educated to do that. So there's definitely an order in which I teach. And I talked about the three functions of the hands. Well, there's, I'm going to say there's three and a half, actually. And as I say, I hope some of you will join me this afternoon, because I'm going to go into this in more depth. And I was rather hoping that we might have a, you know, you might be able to see what I'm going to do here on a big screen. Um, but this will show up easier 
in, in the smaller, smaller session this afternoon. But the first thing I actually teach isn't quite hands. It's what I call a tricep push. Now, I asked a couple of biomechanists, was I okay to say this today, to tell people that the most important thing I teach with beginners, intermediate players, and even some very good players, is the first thing I would teach to get it correct at the bottom, to get the club on the ball with some pop, is I teach people to push the hands away from the chest. To push the hands away from the chest. Now, I suppose you might say, well, that's triceps, it lasts. I, I get that. But for the club golfers, you can think hands. You can push the hands away from the chest. And why do you want to do that? The reason you want to do that is you have to keep a radius in the swing. You need a radius to get to the bottom of the ball. You need a radius for accuracy. I don't know where that went. I missed one out there. There's one missing there. It's supposed to say no radius, no good. And I agree with that. No radius, no good. Now, how do I teach a radius? Fairly straightforward. As a matter of fact, I just use some of these ProFlex bands, put them behind my back. Some of you may or may not be able to see this from the back, but this is as simple as it gets for me. You push, you push the hands away from the chest, and if you can keep some amount of pressure in those pro flex bounce through the swing, I think you'll keep a radius. The golf pros here most certainly know that at a regular level, the mistake we see with poor players, even intermediate players, is the sum of that look at impact some to a lot, to an awful lot. And it took me a long time to understand when Peter Croker talked about pushing the pushing, that the push he was talking about was the triceps. So what I try and teach first is I push, that's my sort of half hand thing. Um, the next thing I teach, I'm going to feel in these slides are going to be out of order here, which is a little bit unfortunate. I'll go back, yeah, they are. Um, the next thing I teach would be lead wrist flexion. The second thing I teach is lead wrist flexion. That I want the lead wrist to be in slight flexion right there. Now for me, I learned that when I called a friend of mine who was in the golf machine, a book that I really like. For me, I liked it when I said to him, Joe, is, is, there, a, is there a lag in a six inch putt? Because I've been teaching what people typically call the lag, you know, the big lag. And I suddenly thought, is there a lag in a six inch putt? And there certainly could be. There's lag if you think of lag being a flexion of the wrist. And the way I teach this, and the way I would say I have, I feel I have good success with this, is some of you close will be able to see it, but if you took a piece of tape and put it on your lead wrist, and you put another piece of tape, and you put it down your sort of lead hand, those of you that are close can see, it's very clear that one is trailing the other. If you teach golf, even the fitness experts, I would encourage you to think of ways to create that to happen. I think that's the most important thing to do first, to teach that flexion. I do that with tape on the wrist. I think the worst players have the most extension and impact. Um, I well understand there's a lot of talk now about going from flexion towards extension, make no mistake. The worst players have the most extension impact, and as best as I can tell, very few, if any players on the PJ Tour, are in extension, meaning it's cut to dip. They're on the way there, I don't miss that. They're going from a lot of flexion to some flexion to little flexion, but they are in flexion at impact. So be very careful if you buy, if you watch your stuff on the internet that says, get people to flexion as soon as possible. I don't buy that at all, and the grass don't support it either. Um, so, let's see what comes up on the next slide. This should be interesting. <laughs> yes, you see, no radius, no good. Moving on. Okay, flexion with big feet. We've already done that. Okay. Okay. Really, the sort of the second thing I would teach, because I'm, I'm saying it's push, and then it's flexion. And the second thing I would teach is supination. Supination of the lead hand. Sup is up. And the reason I do that is the club face is in the process of closing. That really is not open for discussion. Why on earth some people think there is a way to play golf 
where you can get the club down here and keep it square to the arc through the hitting area and it's not closing is completely beyond me and people who think that haven't studied 3D. The golf club is going from here to here. Let me tell you a quick story. I know I'm running, I'm getting close, but I'm going to tell this story. I had a young man I taught who was very bright, about 16, physics chap, and I used this sort of non-wafted club. I'll talk about this this afternoon. I think it's great. A club with no waft gives you a really true representation of where the face of the club is pointing. And I said, Alex, I want you to tell me where you see the club face go during the golf swing. And so I made what I thought was a fairly decent golf swing with this magnet, and it was about as good as I could do. And I was trying to give you some club face control. And I said, now you're watching this magnet, aren't you, Alex? Yeah, I'm watching it, I'm not watching it. And I came down, and I did what I thought was about correct. I said, Alex, what do you think the club face does in a golf swing? And he gave me the best answer I've ever heard. It goes everywhere! <laughs> it does! That's what makes this game so much. It goes everywhere! That's why it's so bloody hard! But I will tell you that with the magnet and the club, this was a very good training aid until I destroyed it actually. It's got no loft on and it is so good for showing people where the face of the club is. Now, back to Paul Berthely, catch the raindrops through the hitting area. That's a wonderful way to have the club in the process of closing. Paul would say, feed what you need over here, wonderful advice. The process of closing, it doesn't mean it's closed, but let me tell you this, if you get one, two, and three, if you get some push from the arm, so you've got a radius, if you teach flexion, you'll have probably a little bit of descent. If you catch the raindrops, if you have one, two, and three, you should have a fairly solid shot in a fairly good direction. I'm not saying it's perfect, but that's a good order to teach them in. Now, the last one that I teach is holding the angle. Did I say holding the angle? I didn't mean that. I mean finding a way that that angle stays in place until it's time for those angles to expand. Um, I think if you try and teach a lot of lag first, as I did, if you try and teach a lot of this first, you will have a lot of poor players slice the ball, shank the ball, and generally not do very well at all. Um, so that is the order in which I teach hand action. I think it needs to be taught with regard to sort of hand action. I say hand action, when I'm teaching, I say hand action is like haircuts and gardens. Leave them too long, it just gets messy. And they do. If you're not training hand action, you're probably not being the best you can be for average players. Just one last thing I want to say here before I sum up. Now, does this mean that I think the body responds to the hands and wrists? No, no, no. Here's what I think. The body anticipates the knees and the hands and arms. And that's very different than response. Anticipates to me, when I grew up in England, soccer, someone kicks it down the right wing. Well, before the ball is kicked, a good soccer player will anticipate where the ball is going to go. A good hockey player will anticipate where the puck is going to be hit. Anticipate, to me, means moves in front of. And one of those slides that got a little bit out of order there was George Hibbard said, your golf swing is subservient to your release. I believe that to be true. He's not a well-known author, but he's a very good one. Your golf swing is subservient to release. If you have a release with some flexion, with some supination, there's a good chance the body will move. Where do I think the angle is held from? I think the hips leave the shoulders, the shoulders leave the arms, the arms leave the hands, but you still got to have a delivery of the club at the bottom. As I said when I started, I don't think cracking the whip works for the best players. Does Rory McIlroy crack the whip? Extremely well indeed. So let me just sum up here, because I'm about 33 seconds out. I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dave. It's gone. Uh, OK, so back to the beginning now. Um, but seriously, to just finish off, my wife and I, Lisa, we love the Masters, and the best bit of the Masters, whether we go there or whether we watch it on TV, is to watch the ceremonial starters. It used to be Sneed and Sarah and Nelson, 
and now it's Nicholas and Palmer and player and they can all still hit the ball and they can all hit it beautifully. Now, they've long gone being able to move the hips like Rory McIlroy, fire the thorax like Adam Scott, but they can still play. If you're waiting for Rory McIlroy to walk through your door and make you a star, you might be waiting a while. If you're wanting to help the 15 handicappers, or the example I always use, Eddie Slotnick, 72-year-old retired doctor, if you're trying to help those people, I think it is worth looking at Teach the flexion first, teach the supination second, go for the angle third. The angle is the easiest to see and it's the easiest to mess them up with. Should it be there? Of course it should. So, to each of us, golf professionals, fitness experts, medical practitioners, I ask you to give consideration to the order in which you teach your hands. I ask the people in the fitness business that as you work on strengthening the core, which is essential, no question, Try and find some ways to use the fine motor muscles. So here's my summary, I think. <laughs> Here we go. Over my 35 years, what I used to teach first, I now teach last. I teach pushing with the arms, I teach flexion, I teach supination, and I teach the ulnar radial last, and it's worked pretty well for me. I want to thank you for listening. It's a great pleasure to be here. I hope some of you will join me this afternoon where I can go into some more of this in, uh, in a lot more depth. And I appreciate every one of you being here. I admire all of you being here. You're all going to get better. Thank you.